Families demand justice after Katsina and bad governance, protest deaths, injuries. Controversy in Edo State as Philip Shaibu resumes duty while state government alleges impersonation. President Tinubu unveils compressed natural gas buses, vows to satisfy Nigerians' demands on transportation. And on the foreign scene, Uganda landslide death toll rises to 23. Hello and welcome to Trust News Hour tonight. I am Eugenia Abu. Parents and relatives of Shafi Mukhtar, who was allegedly killed as well as those wounded during Monday's hardship protest in Katsana, are demanding justice from relevant authorities. This follows allegations that their relatives were brutalized and suffered tear gas attacks and gunshot wounds allegedly fired by security operatives. In Katsina, Abdullahi Yamadi visited the families of both the deceased and the wounded persons and filed in this report. A few hours after President Bola Ahmad Tinubu addressed the nation on Sunday, Nigerians hit the streets in anger that the president's speech did not in any way make attempts to address their plights. In Katsina, the protesters were quickly dispersed by angry security operatives who described the protesters as a herd crowd that was out to loot and destroy public and private properties. According to reports, few minutes after dispersing the protesters, the angry security personnel turned on other residents, shooting live ammunition on harmless civilians, leading to many escaping with gunshot wounds of various degrees. <laughs> Shati Mukhtar was not lucky to survive as he lost his life after being shot on his way to a neighborhood where he went to eat with some of his friends. It is a moment of sorrow and grief to the family of 25-year-old Shafi Mukhtar who was allegedly shot dead by suspected security operatives. Mourners and sympathizers were trooping to register their condolences when Trust TV News crew visited. <laughs> Family members and relatives of Shapiu are in pains over the unfortunate killing of their loved one who just completed his secondary education and was contributing towards sustaining the family. Mukhtar Muhammad, the father of the deceased, described the killing of his son as the result of a high level of unprofessionalism by the security operatives and demanded the investigation and prosecution of the perpetrators. The mother of the deceased could not hold back her emotions, saying she left the killers of her son in the hands of God, who is the almighty judge. The killers of my innocent son have done their worst. I want to passionately appeal to Governor Duko Umorurada and all relevant authorities to investigate the killing with a view to bringing the perpetrators to book. Shafiu's killing left a huge vacuum here, which will further exacerbate hardship being experienced by this family. In the same vein, a pregnant woman lost her life following the tear gas she inhaled, which was allegedly fired inside her matrimonial home while in labor, according to reports. Some of the survivors are currently receiving medical attention at hospitals, while some with minor gunshot wounds have been discharged. I am innocent because I was standing about 500 meters away from the roadside. Right inside our community, someone shot me on my leg. I was rushed to a hospital. There, I saw over 10 casualties. 
I saw medical personnel crying over this brutality. I thank God I'm still alive. I was by the gate of our house trying to lock it. I couldn't run because my eyes were hurting due to the tear gas that was fired into our houses. I believe it was at that moment a security personnel fired a shot on my hand. I am really and seriously in a severe pains. However, public commentators are lamenting the unfortunate killing and the number of casualties recorded during the protest, calling on the relevant authorities to investigate and prosecute those responsible to serve as deterrent. As at press time, neither the government nor security agencies have issued any statement on the incident. Abdullahi Izumayamadi, Trust Television News, Kazana. In the meantime, Kano State Police have arrested 873 suspects linked to the destruction and looting of public property during recent hunger protests across the state. Addressing a press conference, State Police Commissioner Salman Dogo disclosed that a significant cache of dangerous weapons was recovered from the suspects during operations conducted from August the 1st to 10th of 2024. Trust TV correspondent Idris Jibrin reports that several other suspects have since been prosecuted. Here's his report. What began as a peaceful demonstration to protest the soaring cost of living in Nigeria quickly spiraled into chaos, leading to widespread violence, destruction and looting of public property across Kanu State. In line with the directive of the Inspector General of Police, IGP Kayode Adeolu Egbetokun, PhD MPM, to all the commands and formation for ensuring professionalism and provisions of police service that is rule of law compliant. The Kano State Police Command has worked diligently and professionally towards addressing the aftermath of this event. In the aftermath of the protest, Police have prosecuted 600 suspects for various offenses, including 150 for violating the curfew. A significant number of dangerous weapons were also recovered. Arrest of an additional six suspects linked with mastermind destruction setting ablaze and looting of Kano Printing Press, KPP, are undergoing investigations. Four. Arrest and transfer of 76 suspect flying Russian flags, including foreigners, to force a quarter, Abuja for district investigation on charge of seditions. Arrest of 41 suspect for other major crime, including armed robbery, kidnapping, car theft. Among the suspect are two armed robbers caught with 10 million naira and two AK-47 rifles. Several others have also been arrested in connection with various crimes committed across the state. The two AK-47 were recovered. And the amount of money that was robbed in the neighboring village before the reports were recovered. The sum of 15 million naira was robbed. And about 10 million naira were recovered immediately after the arrest. Despite the challenges posed by the protest, the police remain resolute in their commitment to protecting the lives and properties of all residents in Kanu State. Idris Jubrin, Trust TV News, Kanu. And still staying in Kanu, the state government has completely lifted the curfew imposed on the state in the aftermath of the violence that greeted the hunger protests. The Commissioner for Information and Internal Affairs, Baba Halilu NTA, made this known on Monday and said the decision followed government's review of the situation, which revealed that the security issue has drastically improved. The governor, who extended his appreciation to the security agencies for their effort in restoring peace in the state, further solicited for continuous prayers for the country, the state, and for continued peace and prosperity. In the wake of the nationwide peaceful protests that was hijacked by hoodlums and turned into violence, 
the state government imposed a 24-hour curfew. However, two days later, the curfew was relaxed from 8 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon and later relaxed further from 6 in the morning to 6 in the evening. Unknown gunmen have attacked Kwasam in Kauru local government area of Kaduna state, killing one doctor, Ishaya, and abducting about eight others. A source said the kidnappers stormed the community in the early hours of Monday and went away with people's property. According to the source, the community is now calm and people are going about their normal duties. The state police command is yet to issue a statement on the incident. Our reporter in the state, Bello Musa, is joining us now to give us an update. Hello, Bello. We thank you for joining us. Thank you. What more have we learned about this attack? Uh, well, um, Kwasam community is located uh, in Kauru local government area. Uh, that is the southern part of Kaduna State, about 140 kilometers uh, uh, from the Kaduna city. Uh, the government attacked uh, the village in the early hours of Monday uh, morning and uh, killing one person and abducted eight people, including women. Uh, the member uh, representing uh, Kauru Federal Constituency, uh, Zakari Ahmed, uh, confirmed the attack, saying that uh, besides uh, members of the community that uh, were kidnapped by the government, uh, on certain amount of uh, properties belonging to the members of the community, uh, uh, the attackers went away, went away with them. Um, property, um, uh, the lawmaker also said uh, uh, the community, a community called uh, Dawaki, uh, was also attacked four days ago, where uh, they also abducted uh, residents uh, of the area. So, so talk to us about whether the police has issued any statement at this time. Well, uh, the police uh, uh, did not issue any statement. Uh, despite the call uh, to the police PPRO, ASP Mansur Hassan, I uh, couldn't get it on phone, and the police uh, uh, did not uh, issue any statement as we speak. Okay, so Kwasam as a community, what kind of security situation was there before this attack? Well, uh, Kwasam, like any other community in Kaduna, especially uh, rural communities in Kaduna, have been facing with a lot of security challenges. So uh, this is not new in, in the state and in even uh, Kuru local government, which is located in the southern part of Kaduna state. Uh, the area uh, recorded a lot of uh, attacks by bandits and gunmen and uh, innocent citizens. So uh, the attack is not new in the community. Thank you very much, Bello, for joining in um, and giving us an update. We've been talking to our reporter in Kaduna, Bello Musa. Thank you for the update. The police in Taraba State say a lecturer with Federal University Wukari and Deputy Registrar of Taraba State School of Health Technology, Takum, were among the passengers killed by gunmen along Takum Wukari Road early Monday morning. The acting police public relations officer, Taraba Police Command, DSP Kwache Gambo, who disclosed this on Monday, said six passengers, including the driver, were killed at a boundary area between Taraba and Benue along Takum Wukari Road. Reports say among the victims was a secondary school principal who was transferred from secondary school Takum to another secondary school in Wukari local government area. He was said to be on his way to report at the new school he was posted to when he was killed in the attack. It was learned that the lecturer from Federal University Wukari was returning to Wukari after spending the weekend with his family in Takum. In another development, gunmen have abducted two Chinese nationals around Kimta along Onigbedu in Ewekoro local government area of Ogun State. A spokesperson of the Ogun State Police Command, Omolola Udutola, confirmed the incident on Monday in Abeokuta. Udutola, however, said efforts were on to ensure the release of the victims. She also stated that the kidnappers had contacted their company to demand a ransom for their release. 
And now to some political news. There was an ease in some quarters in Edo state government circles on Monday when the court reinstated Deputy Governor of Edo State, Comrade Philip Shaibu, in, in a broadcast which lasted three minutes. Shaibu said he had resumed office in line with the ruling of the Federal High Court in Abuja, which faulted the processes of his impeachment. Shaibu said he had informed Governor Godwin Obaseki of his resumption. He also said his aid should be restored, but added that he had not gotten any response. Furthermore, Shaibu cautioned banks dealing with the office of the deputy governor. Today, I am issuing a clear directive to all staff within the deputy governor's office whom have not yet returned to work to resume forthwith. Failure to comply will result in appropriate sanctions. In line with the judgment, the office of the deputy governor was never vacant. In this regard, all transactions that will have been done in my absence remain illegal, null and void, and of no effect whatsoever. I want to make it known that any bank conducting business with the office of the deputy governor of Edo State, without my explicit approval, does so at its own risk. Nevertheless, I want to reassure my dear people of Edo State that I am back in my role as the deputy governor of Edo State, ready to perform my duties, fulfill my responsibilities, and deliver on the promises of democracy. In the meantime, the Edo State government on Monday said Philip Shaibu is impersonating the deputy governor and should stop presenting himself as such. In a statement, the Commissioner for Communication and Orientation, Chris Nahikare, said Shaibu is involved in a clear case of impersonation by parading himself as deputy governor. The statement maintained that the issue of his purported reinstatement is still active in court, with the next hearing for the two separate motions filed by the state government and the Edo State House of Assembly challenging the purported reinstatement by Justice James Omotosho, scheduled for 24th of September 2024. The state, through the Attorney General of Edo State and the Edo State House of Assembly, represented by their lawyers, Uluwole Yamu, SAN, and Ken Muzia, SAN, respectively, have sought an order for a stay of execution of the reinstatement, an order suspending the judgment and a restraining order preventing Shaibu from presenting himself or attending any official function as deputy governor pending the hearing and determination of the appeal. President Bola Tinubu says the use of gas resources to power the transportation industry is an economic necessity as it will reduce the reliance on petrol, which currently constitutes a significant portion of the country's fuel demand. He spoke on Monday at State House Abuja when he commissioned the first set of 30 compressed natural gas CNG buses. The president took a break from the Federal Executive Council meeting to officially launch the buses. Kainde Amudu now reports. The first order of the day at Monday's Federal Executive Council meeting was the swearing in of the new head of service of the Federation, D.D. Walson Jack. As the new head of service steps into the office, President Tinumbu is paying tribute to former head of service, Folashade Yemi Eson. She served our nation exceptionally well, with distinction, guiding the civil service through significant transformation and reform. Another key program of the day is the launch of CNG-powered buses to enhance the country's transportation system. The 30 buses designed and manufactured locally by Innocent Motors are part of government's efforts to alleviate transportation challenges, especially in the federal capital territory. Nigerians are going to be saving money. The environment is also going to be cleaner because I mean, fossil fuels are usually uh, uh, you know, less environmentally friendly. Uh, the CNG initiative is one that is designed to first save money for Nigerians and secondly also uh, make the environment uh, cleaner uh, and uh, more habitable for all of us. The president is emphasizing the need for Nigerians to utilize its vast natural gas resources, describing it as an economic necessity. For many countries, especially 
Nigeria with our own gas, if we work harder, be productive and innovative, it is an economic necessity that we should embrace. The hybrid CNG buses are donated by the Depot and Petroleum Product Marketers Association, DATMAN. At least every state you go to in Nigeria, you should be able to see these CNG buses. And that's what is so important, that there are CNG buses and they are supposed to um, bring down the cost of transportation. As we heard the president say that 80% um, of fuel is being spent on commercial vehicles and we're hoping that this one will, uh, to a large extent, enhance our strength to prosperity in Nigeria. The provision of these CNG buses is a response to demands by the organized labor movement. Each bus can transport up to 100 people and has the flexibility to run on diesel if needed, addressing potential CNG shortage concerns. From State House Abuja, Kainde Amudu, Trust TV News. The federal government has mandated all government organizations and agencies to procure military hardware from the military industrial complex at the Defense Industry Corporation Daikon Kaduna. While addressing a news conference in Abuja ahead of the 60th anniversary of the Defense Industry Corporation Daikon, the permanent secretary of the Ministry of Defense, Ibrahim Kana, said it is only when the desired hardware is unavailable at Daikon that government organizations will be allowed to make procurements from abroad. Kana explained that the new Daikon Act signed into law by President Bola Tinubu mandates government agencies to look inward for military hardware procurement to contribute to Nigeria's national development and national security. He said such patronage is capable of boosting foreign exchange earnings through local production of defense equipment in addition to creating jobs for skilled Nigerians and reducing capital flight to foreign nations. Moving to other stories now, the Transmission Company of Nigeria, TCN, says some local governments in Jigawa and Yobe are currently witnessing electricity blackout due to a truck that rammed into one of its electricity towers in Kano State. A statement by TCN's General Manager of Public Affairs, Ndidimba, stated that the accident that occurred at Gundwawa Village, Gizawa local government area, Kano State, on Sunday, 11th of August, affected Tower T-16. It listed communities affected to include Hadeja, Kumel, Gagarawa, Nguru, Malamadori, Perniwa, Kafinghausa, Auyo, and Guri. Others are Kaugama, Taura, Garki, Megatari, Babura, Kirkasama, and Machina local government areas in Jigawa and Yobe. She said the communities are in darkness and there is no alternative source of bulk power supply to two of TCN substations. Thus, the affected areas will not have supply until the tower is repaired. According to her, a contractor has been contracted to reconstruct the tower and has since mobilized to site. 25 people have been confirmed dead in a boat mishap at Wamako local government area of Sakwato State. According to a source, a canoe with about 40 passengers capsized on the Dundae River. The source added that the victims, who are primarily women and children, were on their way to their farms across the river when the accident happened. He said about 15 victims were rescued by swimmers in the village, while about 25 were still missing as re rescue effort continues. Confirming the incident, the special advisor to the Sokoto State Governor on State Emergency Management, Nasir Garba Kalambaina, said a rescue operation team and the National Emergency Management Agency officials had been mobilized to the village for rescue operations. Kalambaina attributed the mishap to the overflow of River Dundai in the Wamako local government area of the state. Oh, 
Tragedy struck the community of Runjimbarmo village in Kajiji district, located in the Shagari local government area of Sokoto state, as seven members of a single family succumbed to a deadly cassava delicacy. In a communique issued by Nura Bello, the information officer of the state ministry of health, the distressing news was confirmed on Sunday. According to the statement, the village head, Muhammadu Modi, detailed the heart-wrenching incident to the commissioner for health as Abib al Arabi, revealing that the victims had partaken in the contaminated cassava meal during dinner. Government officials swiftly mobilized to the scene to investigate the root cause of the tragedy with the aim of prompt communication to the authorities for requisite intervention. Commissioner Balarabi announced plans to collect samples from a surviving teenager who had also consumed the tainted cassava dish. Amidst the grim turn of events, Commissioner Balarabi extended her heartfelt condolences to the grief-stricken populace of the affected area, expressing solidarity in the face of the incident. Civil servants engaged in farming activities in Bochi State have continued to lament the lack of subsidized fertilizer after the state government declared two days as work-free days to improve food security in the state. They stated this amidst the effect of climate change that may have affected the 2024 rainfall pattern and its attendant impact on agricultural produce. Trust TV's Adamu Imam has that report. Since the announcement of two days of no work for civil servants from level 1 to 12 by the state government, farmers were excited as the reason that the development will help farmers to easily access fertilizer loans. The government made the announcement during a media briefing after the state executive council meeting last week. So in presence of that, we recommended that civil servants both at the state and the local governments, you know, this is a food security issue. So we are not uh, mindful of any other encumbrance. But certainly it is a food security issue and it affects everybody. So council has approved that from tomorrow that I'm going to issue a circular, civil servants in both the both at the state and the local government level will be free to go to farm from Thursday. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Meanwhile, some interested farmers have been seeking alternative ways of addressing the fertilizer issue. Up to this moment that I'm talking to you, there is no any sign of receiving fertilizer from the state government as fertilizer loan. And they granted civil servants two work free days to enable us to concentrate on our farm. Meanwhile, no information about where and how to get the fertilizer has been shared. We are still appealing to the government to look at our farms and come to our aid. Yes, it is true that we are yet to receive the government fertilizer. It is sad that even after launching the sales of the commodity, we still buy in the markets. Since the one for workers' loan is no longer feasible, then we resorted to other ways and that are not the best. Because if really they want to help workers, then they would have released the fertilizer as early as April or beginning of May, if not there is a big problem when it comes late to farmers. Governor Bala's move really excited us because we, the junior workers, we have the opportunity to visit our farms in good time so that we supervise what is going on and see where to improve. And now we will have time for rainy season, though we can't conclude because everything can change all of a sudden. The state government had earlier launched the sales of NPK fertilizer in this local government area at the rate of 20,000 naira per bag last month and also exhibited some modern tractors, food processing equipment and machines to encourage mechanized farming in the state. Adam Imam, Trust TV News, Bauchi. 
Weeks after the federal government announced that it has sent 20 trucks of food to each state, the Adamawa state government says it is yet to see even a single truck. Secretary to the state government, Awal Tukur, revealed this to the press shortly after an expanded security meeting called at the instance of Governor Amadou Umaru Fintiri. Gibson Suadigo reports from Yola. The meeting held at the government house in Yola was attended by heads of security operatives, traditional rulers and top government officials. In a briefing after the meeting, Awal Tukur highlighted the meeting's focus on the general security of the state, the recent and bad governance protest, hunger, and other developmental issues. He attributed the peaceful nature of the end bad governance demonstration in Adamawa to the proactive governance of Governor Fintry. What we analyze what happened, how we went through it, and what government and society should be doing to ensure the peace sustains and the peace continues. So we address those matters. It was, they were identified as issues afflicting our people. There's a lot of hunger in this society. There's a lot of problems. People have to be given that hope that this they have been listened to, the issues have been addressed, and those are part of what we went through in nitty gritty. In addition, other areas of security concerns, farmer had a clashes. How do we ensure this continues in peace? How do we address the issues? Uh, issues of illegal miners, for example. That was addressed. Tukur also addressed the announcement by the federal government of Nigeria regarding sending 20 trucks of food to each state, stating that the state government is yet to receive any. He, however, mentioned that the state government is taking positive steps to procure and distribute food to the citizens to alleviate the challenges they are facing. I've not seen any 20 trucks of rice of recent. If they are coming, then they're on the way. But nobody has informed us, let alone even to anticipate that. So that much, we have not seen those particular 20 trucks of rice now. Yes, we are gathering that. We are always, like I said, this is a proactive government. We don't wait until there's a crisis. And don't forget also, we also must be conscious of when to procure these items. It was one of the matters addressed here. If we go into markets to procure at the wrong time, it will send shocks down the system. People will be buying food at a higher price. So we are cautious of that. We are watching at the right time. I'm sure you see the reaction of, of the state government. Additionally, it was revealed that Governor Fintry was pleased with the professional conduct of the security during the end bad government protest. Gibson saw Adigo, Trust TV News, Yola. The Borno state governor has appealed to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees to key into its durable solutions and humanitarian peace development nexus plans in addressing humanitarian crises and sustainable plans for building the resilience of displaced persons in Borno State. The governor stated this during a courtesy visit from the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees at the Government House in Meiduguri. Trust TV's Beatrice Guruzzi reports on this and other stories. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees' courtesy call on the Borno State Governor is to strengthen ties towards the needed humanitarian assistance for displaced persons and refugees in neighboring countries. The discussion focused on sustainable plans that will yield lasting solutions to humanitarian crisis and the Borno State Government's durable solutions and humanitarian peace development nexus plans on how displaced persons will be resettled, supported, and protected. Governor Zulum, while explaining the component of these plans, said he wants to repatriate refugees from other countries. While we shall work on with you to see how we shall immediately repatriate those that are living in Chad, as well as in Chad. I know the process is very cumbersome, Time consuming as well as money consuming. But together we shall get a sustainable solutions from IDPs, both in terms of protection as well as in terms of repatriation. Uh, we can see that this is very much in line with the objective that you have clearly laid out, Excellency. Uh, and, and we believe that this is a direction in which we can go as the security situation improves. Uh, some will be able to go back to their place of origin, but we have to make sure that it is done sustainably 
in conditions of safety and dignity. Um, and for that, investments are required in places of return. You also have individuals who will say, I want to stay after 10, 15 years in the place where I am. And they also need to be provided with, with, with that support. Meanwhile, the governor also received the governing council of the University of Meduguri and the government house. We have no any better evidence than the University of Meduguri. All of us are major stakeholders. My main objective is to ensure that the University of Meduguri regains its lost glory in terms of academic excellence. I'll ensure I'll support all initiatives from the governing council that will ensure growth and development of the university in a sustainable manner. I believe the founding fathers of this university will be proud of your investment in that university, either dead or alive. And uh, Guys, I would like to, on behalf of the children and the people of Borno State, to request for more assistance, especially to the people and the children of the downtrodden. We have learned of the scholarships that have been given to the children of Borno State. And we would like also, through your contacts, both nationally and internationally, to assist us so that we bring projects and programs that will definitely better the University of Meduguri. The governor assured the delegation of his support and commitment to partner with the university in areas of research and development to promote security and agricultural advancement. Dutro Skuruti, Trust TV News, Meduguri. The River State High Court has sacked the caretaker committee chairman of the All Progressives Congress, APC, in the state, Tony Okocha. Justice Sika Aprioku instead nullified the sack of Emeka Beke as APC chairman and reinstated him. The court also nullified the dissolution of the elected state working committee led by Beke, while simultaneously nullifying the appointment of Okocha and his caretaker committee members. The judge further issued an order restraining Okocha and his members from parading themselves as ESCO members of the APC in the state. In a swift reaction, Okocha questioned the motive of the judge in delivering the judgment against him, insisting that he is still in charge and will appeal the judgment. In a separate press briefing, Beke thanked his supporters for standing firm and the judiciary for not being cowed. When pressed on other issues, BK said the APC will take part in the council elections, adding that, Martini, that, adding that Martin Amehwile and 24 other lawmakers are members of the APC and would be invited to pledge their loyalty in the coming days. The leadership of the Action People's Party, APP, at the national level has condemned the explosion at its secretariat in River State leaving a trail of destruction and fear of escalating political violence in the state. The APP, which is relatively new in River State, drew attention to itself recently after securing and decorating a building in the highbrow area of Port Harcourt for its secretariat. Here's that report. The national chairman of the party, Uchina Nadi, who spoke in Port Harcourt after expecting the level of damage at the party secretariat described the development as an attack on democracy, calling on President Bola Tinebu and security agencies to ensure that those behind the act are fished out and punished. The state chairman of the APP, Sonny Nwokoro, said the party is not deterred by the threats. It's really a sad day for democracy. We condemn it in its strongest term, the act of bombing our river state chapter Secretariat. It is a heinous act. It is an act of terrorism. It is a tre treasonable act. Just that as civilized people, as civilized people, we try not to be violent. But if anybody, those who have done this, have thought that this would deter us, unfortunately, it has given us more reserve 
to go on to do what we're supposed to do because it's a clear indication of defeat on their side. It's a clear indication that we are doing the right thing and we will not be decided in any format. While the national chairman of the party also stated that those behind the attack were afraid of the APP in the forthcoming local government election, its reverse state chairman, Sonny Nwokoro, added that the party in the state has received many PDP members and is ready for the forthcoming local government election. River State Police Commissioner Tunji Disu affirmed that the police have launched an investigation into the matter. He advised everyone in the state to be security conscious while he awaits the report of the probe. Disu stated this after leading a delegation of officers to inspect the facility in the new GRA of Port Harcourt. These people at first, they said that conduct local government election. The governor said plans in place to conduct local government election. We know how they have been shopping for one order or the other in all the course in the federation, trying to stop the local government uh, 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 forthcoming election. They have seen that they have not, they are not able to achieve that. They have resorted to violence. We are not deterred in any way. We are not deterred in any way. We are only asking that the governor of River State, he's been doing well and he swore an oath to uphold the laws of this land to defend life and property and he's doing that but most importantly everybody have to take their security very important uh like i quickly sent in our officers in here yesterday because anywhere there's explosion there's likely to be a second one so we usually we move people away from that and that is what my team succeeded in doing yesterday report says the river state police command has deployed two security vehicles and personnel to the scene in the new GRE. The Independent Electoral Commissions in Kwara and Anambra states have fixed September the 21st and 28th for local government elections. The Kwara State Independent Electoral Commission said it has set machinery in motion to conduct the local government election next month to usher in the democratically elected chairman for the 16 local government councils in the north central state. While the ruling all Progressive Congress, APC, said it is ready for the exercise. The opposition People's Democratic Party, PDP, expressed reservation over the planned exercise. For nearly five, five years, the 16 local government areas in Kwara State have been run by sole administrators, but the recently inaugurated members of the State Independent Electoral Commission said they are ready to conduct the election in the councils. In a related development, the Anambra State Independent Electoral Commission in a statement said local government polls would be held across the 21 local government councils in the southeastern state. About 15 states have announced or held local government elections in the last one month since the Supreme Court granted financial autonomy to the third tier of government, ordering the federal government to pay the 20.60% monthly allocation of the 774 local governments in the country directly to their exclusive accounts and not to accounts controlled by governors. Colonialism, a system of domination in which one nation controls and exploits another territory and its people, has left an indelible mark on global history. The formal end of colonialism marked by the wave of decolonization in the mid-20th century saw many nations in Africa, Asia and the Caribbean achieve political independence. However, the legacy of colonialism persists in various forms and the struggle to end its influence continues with many calling for an end to colonial rule ahead of the 2030 UN deadline. Trust TV's Dorcas Yakubu completes that report. The history of colonialism is extensive and complex, spanning several centuries and involving many regions across the world. The legacy of colonialism is evident in the political, economic and social structures of former colonies. The arbitrary borders drawn by colonial powers have often resulted in ethnic conflicts and political instability. Many former colonies continue to grapple with underdevelopment, dependency on primary commodity exports, and debt burdens rooted in colonial exploitation. These has led to calls for decolonization. We really have to organize to make sure that those uh, territories still under colonial rule or not self-governing must 
regain their independence as soon as possible. That's the essence. When a man is enslaved, it's a problem because he's owned by another human being. So when a country is enslaved by another country, it's also a problem. So you can never, agitations can never end unless people determine what they will do. If we have a vision of a united world, that that unity that can only happen if we are all equal, if we act in equality. And that's not, the imperialism and the colonies is a system uh, that opposed to that equality that we're fighting for, that we're looking for. Colonialism has left a legacy of racial and cultural hierarchies that continue to affect national identities and social cohesion. Despite the pervasive influence of neocolonialism, stakeholders say there's a growing need to resist and challenge this domination. So in a society, in a world where we want more development, we want to have less hunger, we want a place where people can live in peace and happily together. It is extremely important that people are no longer dominated and oppressed and in many cases violently so, which has been the process of colonialism that we know to date. The struggle for true independence and self-determination continues as formerly colonized nations seek to overcome the legacy of colonialism and assert their place in the global order. Bringing an end to colonialism in the world involves addressing both the remnants of traditional colonial practices and the more insidious forms of neocolonialism that have emerged in the post-colonial era. Dr. Siakubu, Trust TV News, Abuja. This is News Hour on Trust TV. It's time now to join Yusuf Akogu for Business News Update. Over to you, Yusuf. <music> Welcome to Business News. I am Yusuf Akogu. The Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, has reported a sharp rise in international payments amounting to $3.31 billion in the first five months of 2024, despite global economic hiccups. This represents a significant 30.8% increase from the $2.53 billion recorded during the same period in 2023. The surge in payment was largely driven by 96.3% increase in foreign debt servicing, which alone accounted for $2.19 billion, or 66.1% of the total payment. This international payment, which include foreign debt servicing, remittances, and payment for goods and services, play a critical role in maintaining Nigeria's economic stability. Nigeria Deposit Insurance Corporation said it has reimbursed 82.36% of the customers to the French Heritage Bank with deposit below the 5 million Naira maximum insured deposit. Director of Communications and Public Affairs, NDIC, Bashir Noho, said in a statement on Sunday that this was achieved through the use of BVN Link alternative account of the customers of the defunct bank. He said the corporation began the payments of the insured deposit of 5 million naira maximum per deposit within a, a record time of four days of the bank closure. He added that the NDIC has commenced a debt recovery process and realization of investment and fiscal assets of the defunct bank to generate funds to ensure timely reimbursement of customers with deposits of above 5 million naira insured deposits. NGS opened a week in red as portfolio managers dump equities for cash. Let's see how it went down. A boss cement lead the losers there down 9.93% to close at 114 naira and 30 copper per share. Transco Hot also down there 5.90% to close at 92 naira and 50 copper per share. Of course, Sky Aviation also down there 5.43% to close at 24 naira and 40 copper per share. This has pushed down the market downward by 0.71% in, in terms of volume of trade. 498.271 million volume of shares were traded, valued at 11.77 billion naira. In a list of 10,645 did happen on the floor this Monday. Of course, in terms of top trading equities by volume, JITCO leader table 123.92 million shares it traded. Veritas Capital 39.31 million shares it also traded. Of course, Assets Corporation 38.30 million shares it traded at the close of business today. Of course, some equities recorded gains despite the negative uh, posture of the market. J Berger leader table up there 10% to close at 121 naira per share. NASCON also gained 10% to close at 34 naira. 65 copper share of course total Nigerian PLC 9.98 percent it gained to close at 470 naira and 40 copper per share there and that's the highlight of stock trading as it went down this Monday on the floor of NGS let's see the global stock market and exchange rate data for today <music>
Oil prices rose for a fifth consecutive session on Monday, extending gains from the previous week's more than 3% rise as U.S. recession fears ease and Middle East supply risk provided support. At the London market, Brent crude sells for $80 per barrel. For the open basket, price studies at $77 per barrel. And that's business. I am Yusuf Akogu. Thank you, Yusuf. Away from Nigeria, the death toll from a garbage landslide in the Ugandan capital, Kampala, has risen to 23, a city official said Monday. People and livestock were buried in mountains of waste at the landfill in the northern Kampala district of Kitizi on Saturday after a collapse caused by heavy downpour. The area's resident commissioner, Yasin Ndide, has said on Sunday that the victims included five children. Over the weekend, excavators churned through the huge rubbish mounds as the desperate search for survivors was watched by wailing and weeping residents. The incident was described as a national disaster by City Mayor Irayas Lukwago, who warned at the weekend that many, many more could be still buried in the heap as rescue operation continued. He had raised concerns over hazardous risks of overflowing waste from the 36-acre landfill, which was established in 1996, and takes in almost all garbage collected across Kampala. It's time now for us to join Emmanuel Fashemi for Sports News Update. The Ministry of Sports Development has called on Nigerians to embrace peace and unity, which signifies the sporting spirit of the 2024 Olympic Games. The Olympics concluded on Sunday at the iconic 80,000-seater Stade de France, which was transformed into a gigantic concert hall. After a series of beautiful performances filled with French culture, the Olympic flag was lowered and the International Olympic Committee IOC President Thomas Bach passed the flag to mayor of the second largest city in the United States of America, Mayor Karen Bass of Los Angeles, the host of Nest Olympics. A total of 329 events of 32 different sports were all finished without much interruption with Team Nigeria participating in 12 events with 88 athletes. A statement from the Ministry of Sports says despite Nigeria's made a drought at the games, the performance of the athletes sparked excitement around the 774 local government areas in Nigeria, with Nigerians staying up late at night to watch their team compete. It added that the journey in Paris has inspired ministry to start preparations for the next games coming up in Los Angeles in 2028 to enable the nation rewrite history. While appealing for understanding from Nigerians, Following the medal drought of Team Nigeria, the ministry assured that the leadership of the minister, John Owaneno, is ready to turn the tides around and restore the country's sporting glory. The Sunder by seven wickets in the third place match of the Division 2 qualifiers on Sunday in Tanzania. The Rwandese batted first during the encounter but were only able to put 45 runs on board for all out in 23.4 overs as Nigeria's bowling charge was led by Captain Gaffa Karim who bowled 5.4 overs, considered just 8 runs and got 4 wickets. Kapot, along with Syria alone, and host Tanzania ahead of the next phase of the qualifiers. And that is sports. I am Emmanuel Fashini. And with that, we have come to the end of the news hour on Trust TV tonight. Do not forget to follow us across all our social media platforms and join our YouTube live stream for more news programs and documentaries. On behalf of the hardworking team behind the scene, I am Eugenia Abu. We thank you for watching. <laughs>